Hey everybody, welcome to another sit down with Michael Francis. Hope everybody is doing well. And uh, 500,000 subscribers, we hit the mark. We did it in, I think, eight months, people. Thanks to all of you. Really appreciate it. The big winner for the big giveaway, going to be revealed soon. And uh, man, we're so appreciative. Again, you have a lot of content. The fact you tuned into mine, that's why we do these giveaways. The next one, I guess, is going to be either at 750,000 or a million. Uh, but thank you so much. Again, we really appreciate it. And michaelfrancis.com, again, growing in that community, over 14,000 people now that we're in contact with, that we provide content for, that are encouraging one another. So jump on board, michaelfrancis.com. Today, I got a very interesting sit down. Um, let me tell you a quick story. I am in uh, LA County Jail. I was doing federal time, but LA County picked me up. They were trying to indict me on some nonsense stuff way back in the early 90s. And I'm in lockdown. They got me in the hole. And uh, the cell that I'm in, I'm on murderer's row, they called it. Everybody on that tier was either facing life without parole or the death penalty. So they called it murderer's row. It was the tier that O.J. Simpson came on eventually. Uh, the Menendez brothers were there. The ninja killers were there. The whole thing. And it's me on a parole violation f facing some silly charge in L.A. County, right? So I'm down there. I was there for 11 months. And uh, it was a depressing place, one of the worst places I was in. But it wasn't a solid door. They had bars because it was an old-time place. It's not there anymore. Now they moved that, uh, to the Twin Towers in L.A. But anyway, I had nothing to look forward to. I'm in there. I'm trying to get back to Lompoc, believe it or not. You know, I'm fighting the case. Uh, you know, 11 months. It was grueling. And then right outside of my tier, there was a television, right? And uh, so we got to at least watch the television, you know, whatever they put on. At 6 o'clock every night, I believe it was 6 o'clock, okay, a show came on that kind of gave me the only thing I had to laugh about when I was in there, and it was Married with Children, believe it or not. And uh, that's where I was first introduced to Ed O'Neill. I had never seen it on the outside, but he and I, uh, we become friends since then, and uh, I enjoyed that show so much. He was such a character. He's friends with Ray Mancini, Boom Boom, and so we hooked up for this sit-down. You're going to find it very interesting. So, with no further introduction needed, Ed O'Neill, married with children, modern family. The guy's done everything. He was the octopus in one of the Pixar movies. He was just terrific. He's got a great career. Knows some guys on the street. A lot of interesting stuff. So let's roll him. Ed, come on in. Hey, Michael. Ed, how the heck are you, my friend? I'm good. I'm good. I'm happy to do this with you. Well, I really appreciate it. You're here in L.A., right, Ed? Yeah. Yeah, I'm in L.A. Okay. Uh, Ray, call, you know, Ray called me and, and told me he had done your, your, your podcast. I've watched a lot of your videos. Have you? I, yeah, I really enjoy them. The reviews of the, of the mob shows and all that stuff. I got a kick out of it. Yeah, we had a, we had a good time, Ray and I did. He's, uh, he, he's such a great guy. Uh, he's a funny You know, I knew his whole family. I grew up on the north side. He grew up on the south side. Yeah, we had a, we had a good time, Ray and I did. He's, uh, he, he's such a great guy. Uh, uh, he's a funny You know, I knew his whole family. I grew up on the north side. He grew up on the south side of Youngstown. But, you know, I used to watch his brother fight. And I knew his dad and his mom. I knew his sister. Because the YMCA, we all, you know, play handball. It was like a focal point of all the sides of town. Everybody would go down there. So I met Ray, I met Ray like last in the family. Really? Yeah. But uh, he's, a, he's a character. He really is. We, we had a good time. I miss him. You know, I was supposed to be out there last year and we were going to do an event together. And then obviously COVID hit. So we, we put it off. But uh, I'll probably get out there sometime later this year. Do you ever go back to Youngstown? Yeah, but not that much anymore. You know, most people that I grew up with aren't there or, you know, gone. And, uh, it's changed quite a bit. Yeah. It's, now it's called the Rust Belt. You can imagine they hit pretty hard when the mills went down. Sure. <clears throat> a lot of things have changed. Time as well. So I do get back every now and then because I have an aunt 
my mother's youngest sister is still there. So sometimes I, I like to go back and look up some of my old friends. Yeah, you know, it's, it's crazy. I, I get the same feeling when I go back to Brooklyn. It's like I don't even recognize it anymore. It's changed so much. And not for the better, you know. I mean, maybe it's sentimental or what, but I just remember the old days, you know, in the neighborhood when everybody knew each other and it was just, you know, so just a, a whole yeah. great atmosphere, you know. It's funny because Ray got involved in a documentary about Youngstown called Youngstown Still Standing, <clears throat> and he produced it. Mm -hmm. And I and I did something in it. I mean, I, you know, just talked about, you know, guys like Jim Traffic and who I kind of grew up with and some other guys. And I was my, my normal self. I, you know, I was critical. I was positive. But the critical aspect didn't go too well with some of the guys back there because I've been gone a long time. And I think they thought, oh, this guy, you know, he's Mr. Hollywood now or something. I said, man, I was always critical. I love Youngstown, but I was, you know, I was just myself. It was pretty good. Hey, listen, you know what? You, you got to be honest about it. I feel the same way about my neighborhood. And I've said it. I said, when I come back there, I don't recognize it anymore. It's like, uh, you know, it, 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 back in Greenpoint where I grew up, there was two sections. There was the Italian section and the Polish section. And uh, I mean, everybody got along, but, you know, it was it was just it was just so different. It was just a whole family kind of, you know, I always tell people there was no crime in the neighborhood. You know, my father was there. You know, obviously, we had a few guys there that kept uh, kept everything nice and we never locked our doors or windows. And my sisters can come home at one o'clock in the morning and walk the streets. It was never uh, an issue back then. I remember yeah, that was that's the good part about all that. You yeah, know, I, I lived in New York, aside several places, and I was there about 10 years. I met my wife there. She's from Jersey. She was from Teaneck. Actually, originally she was from Hackensack, but uh, knew a lot of guys, you know, Staten Island and and a lot of these Westy guys. I knew from, again, the YMCA because I played handball West 63rd Street and they all played there. So I got to know some of these guys. And then, yeah, it was different. You know, when I got to New York, it was like, whoa, this is like it's like Youngstown, but all split up like Queens and Staten Island. It reminded me a lot of Youngstown, but um, not Youngstown, of course. Did you ever meet uh, Jimmy Coonan or, or Mickey Featherstone or either of those guys? No, I never met those two guys. I met some of the other ones. I think Coonan might have been already in, in trouble that he wasn't around. He was in Jersey, too, I think. He had yeah. a house in Jersey. He did. But it's funny because I auditioned for that movie uh, that they did about those guys with uh, Gary Oldham and... Um, uh, I can't think of the other actor's name who I know. A wonderful actor. I can't remember the name of the movie, but I auditioned for Coonan's part. Did you? At the uh, Chateau Marmont. And the director was this guy named Phil Jawanu, who directed Rattle and Hum, that documentary about you, you two. Right. And he didn't know me. I was sort of, I was doing Married with Children at the time. And I walked into the hotel room. I knew the casting director a, a gal from new york and uh, i looked out the window and there was a billboard on sunset of peggy bundy hitting me over the head with a frying pan and my head was going up and down i thought <laughs> that's not good if they see that <laughs> so i'm doing a scene you'll 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 enjoy this i'm doing a scene when you know because coonan had moved to jersey right he moved out of the neighborhood and um so Sean, uh, Sean Penn was away for quite a while and he had come back and they were wondering what he, what he was doing when he was away. And he said he was working on a ranch in Texas, but he had come back. And then Gary Oldham was sort of the Mickey Featherstone. Right. And they had been old buddies. So he's welcoming him back and they go out to Jersey to see Jimmy. And Jimmy is doubtful about the guy. Is he a cop? Right. So they go down to the rec room and we're shooting pool. And that's where the scene took place. That's what I read the scene for the, you know, the people involved in casting. And it was very friendly, you know, like, man, haven't seen you for a while. Everything all right? You know, what's, where you been? That sort of thing. So halfway through the scene, Juwanu stops, stops me. He says, uh, hold it, hang on, hang on. I said, well, let me ask you a question. Did you read the script? I said, yeah. 
He said, well, you know this guy is a killer. I said, yeah, I don't see it. I said, you don't see, I don't see, you know, the killer in you. <laughs> and I said, well, I'm not killing anybody at the moment. <laughs> what do you want me to do? <laughs> you know what I mean? And that was it for me. <laughs> God. Uh, uh, Harris did it, you know. <sighs> yeah, I can't. He's a wonderful guy, good actor, great actor. So I was out of it at that point. And uh, the movie was it was called State of Grace. Oh, yeah, right. State of Grace, yeah. O Oldham was great in it. it. It was just an okay. It, you know, it wasn't really... I was a little disappointed when I saw it, not because I wasn't in it, but right. it was okay. Yeah, you know what? It's funny. I get asked to review that film quite a bit, but... Uh... Yeah, it was a good film. It was good. It wasn't great. You're right, but it, but yeah, it, was good. it wasn't great, but it was good. Yeah. It was good, and uh, I, yeah, I knew a lot of those guys. I knew I knew um, Bobby Spillane. Oh yeah, Bobby Spillane lived down on I think Ninth Avenue. He had an apartment. You know, he ended up falling out the window on the fifth floor. I hope he fell. I'm not sure. Yeah, nobody quite knows, but he was a good guy. And uh, I knew, so I knew these, a lot of these guys and um, that, that neighborhood then was Clinton, you know, it wasn't Hell's Kitchen anymore. Right. But they were funny because uh, I remember I was, I was in New York doing a series called Big Apple, it was a David Milch short lived eight, eight episodes and out, but I thought it was, it was quite good actually. And before we started shooting it, I was having lunch with Bobby and one of his friends in one of those Spanish restaurants on 8th Avenue or 9th Avenue, I can't remember. Mm -hmm. And this kid came walking by and I knew him from the Y. His name was Bolger. No relation to Whitey. Mm -hmm. John Bolger. And he was a neighborhood guy. I thought, you know, I say, John, how you doing? He said, oh, I'm on my way down to see David Milch. I'm hoping to get a little something in it. And I noticed that Bobby and the other guy were cool to him. Mm -hmm. And I and I said, uh, okay, well, good luck. Yeah, he says, hey, hi, Bobby, you know, hi, Johnny, whatever. And he goes down and I said, well, he's from your neighborhood, right? He, he's not from here. I said, what do you mean he's not from here? He said, he's not from here. Where, is, where was he born? He said, he was born in Boston. Yeah. I said, how long has he been here? He said, I don't know. When did he come here, Bobby? When he was two. <laughs> but he wasn't so born he, there. <laughs> he wasn't from there. Wow. Interestingly enough, you know, Ed spent a lot of time in New York and he's Irish, you know, Irish family. And uh, he got involved with some of the Westies. And, you know, the S Westies were an Irish crew, tough Irish crew, Jimmy Conan, Mickey Featherstone. Uh, I knew J Jimmy, didn't know Mickey. I think I might have met him once. I'm not sure. But uh, tough guys and uh, really, really a strong crew. It was one of the only crews that weren't Italian that we interacted with, you know, because we trusted them. You know, they were they were they were good guys. And uh, Ed has an interesting story about the Westies that he's going to share with us. Well, I'll tell you that, you know, they, they were, uh, the Westies were a tough crew. And, you know, I know we respected them quite a bit. We really they did. They were crazy. Yeah, they yeah. were crazy. crazy. They really were. They were one of the few groups, I would say, that we uh, interacted with and yeah. we associated with. They, they were tough guys. And I, I knew Kunin. I even seen him in prison several times. He was in the same place as my dad. So he was a nice guy. I mean, at least, you know, I, I, I enjoyed talking with him. And, and I never him. met him. I knew he had a thing out for uh, Mickey Spillane yeah. because of the kidnapping incident you know, right. with his dad. I couldn't blame him. But, yeah. Uh, anyway, yeah. So I was just, you know, I was around. I knew these guys from just, you know, I'd go with, sometimes I'd go in the pub and have a drink or something. It was always fun. They were always, they were always very friendly to me. And uh, yeah, I, I, I love the, I love New York. I love Manhattan. Yeah, it's a great place. It's a great place. Do you have a bunk into any guys, uh, you know, in uh, Youngstown? You mean the guys that uh, were, yeah, uh, no, you know. not really. I mean, no, well, um, yeah, I mean, I know I grew up, one of the guys was one of my best friends. Hmm. And uh, he, he, like you, he um, was you know, he was born into it like you were right. And his dad and uncles and father and the whole thing. And then a very good looking, handsome kid spoke fluent Italian, mm -hmm. uh, not a not a first generation Italian. He learned it right from his grandfather. 
and uh, <clears throat> college grad, but got, in, got heavily involved and then uh, married an Italian girl whose father and family were also a part of that life. And somehow then I think he found religion. Really? Very similar to you. And if I said his name, I, I, I don't want to say his name. So when we, when we meet privately, you'll, you'll get a kick out of it because you'll recognize the name. And um, he got out. And there was, a, there was an old man that used to shop. My uncle, through marriage, had a meat uh, company on the south side of Youngstown. And it was like, you know, it wasn't a store. They, they sold to stores. But if you knew somebody, you could go over there and buy, you know, kielbasa, whatever you wanted. Right. And this old guy used to come in with two young kids, two young Italian looking American kids would drive them in an old car. Rumpled old guy, he would come in and they called him Big Dom. Mm -hmm. And he was from Buffalo originally, I found out, but he ran the whole everything. Very polite old guy. You'd never in a million years think he was, you know, anybody at all. And he's the one that let my friend go. But the story I heard was it cost him quite a bit of money. Really? And then he, he couldn't come back only to visit his family. And then it had to be a brief period of time. Hmm. And then he had to go again. So uh, he's to this day, he's, you know, he's, he's, he's doing fine. That's good. But he still keeps in touch, you know, his brothers and sister-in-laws and, you know, he's got kids and a couple different marriages. So he's involved. He's got friends that are doing life and, mm -hmm. you know, in other places and Vegas. And uh, so he, but he still keeps in touch with them. Yeah. He's still fond of uh, some of these guys that you, you wouldn't think a religious fellow like him would still be, but he is. Those things, they, they don't go away. No, they don't, Ed. You know what? You know, I always say you could take the boy out of Brooklyn, but you, take, you can't take Brooklyn out of the boy. You still have those no. feelings, you know. No, that's impossible, right? Yeah, it's, uh, it's not a bad thing. You know, one of my dearest friends, he was, he was a guy in my crew. We called him Frankie G. You might have heard I spoke about him a couple of times, but uh, he was crazy, man. But I loved him, and he just passed away uh, a couple of weeks ago. And it was like he was the last of, of that breed yeah. for me. You know, it's like I'm the only one left. Everybody's gone. You know, my uncle Joe, well, <laughs> there were, there were uh, this guy's name was Joe O'Neill. Mm -hmm. He wasn't related to me by blood, as far as I know. So two O'Neills married into the same family, the Quinlans. My mother was a Quinlan. Mm -hmm. Four Quinlan girls. And he married one of them, and my dad married one of them. So ah. it was very confusing. People thought that, you know, we were right. blood relatives. But he was a lawyer, and he became Joey Naples' lawyer. Mm -hmm. well, Joey Naples was one of the guys. The Carabias were the other family that ran things there. And Joey Naples uh, was my cousin's godfather, my, my uncle's second son. Mm -hmm. So they were close. Joey Naples had Sandy Naples, a brother, and Billy Naples. They were all killed eventually you know in the streets and um joey got killed mm. about it's probably been 10 years now right and um so the, the problem with youngstown was it's not big yeah I mean, these guys would have problems with each other there was nowhere to go yeah they, they were on top of each other right they're on top of each other they knew where their girlfriends were where their gumadas were where their they knew where everything. they hung out. They knew their <laughs> haunts, their restaurants, everything. And all these guys, whatever seemed to do, would be to arm themselves a little more heavily than they normally did. And yeah. Because they didn't know where to go. Ed grew up in Youngstown, Ohio. And for those of you that are familiar with, you know, you know mob movements uh, throughout this country, Youngstown was kind of a stronghold of La Cosa Nostra back then. So Ed didn't really hook up with many of the guys, but he did know them. And he's got some interesting stuff to tell you. Yeah, no, I know. <laughs> it's tough. New York is different. You can hide a little bit in New York, even though there's a lot more guys. There's places you can go. It's a, it's a big place. But... Yeah, you know, well, you know, I call those Ed, the good old bad days. <laughs> That's true, and um, I remember I get so I have so many funny stories about Youngstown. I, but more more or less, they're just amusing. Uh, 
there was a guy named Al Packard. I don't think he was Italian, but he was something. Maybe he was Croatian or something, but he was an iron worker, but he was peripherally involved in with these guys. And then there was another guy who was a, you know, a, a button guy for Joey Naples, who I knew very well. And one time I'm in this restaurant that we used to grew, we grew up in this restaurant bar called the Golden Dawn. And I was with my younger brother having breakfast one morning and these two guys came in and we had a booth, mm -hmm. uh, you know, can we join you? I said, yeah, sit down, come on. So they joined us and they, as they sat, the waitress put our breakfast in front of us. It was typical, you know, eggs, bacon, right. home fries. And the waitress says to the two guys, uh, gentlemen, what can I, what can I get for you guys? You know, and Al Packard looks at our plates and he says, yeah, duplicate. <laughs> <laughs> I never heard anybody say that before or since. Right. Duplicate. Right. <laughs> He's probably one of the most low-key guys that's done more work than you can imagine. I mean, married with children, modern family, you know, the octopus in that great, you know, Finding Dory Pixar movie. He was actually a lead role in that. He's done so much. I mean, if you look at his resume, it's unbelievable. Nicest guy and knows his way around the street. <laughs> Crazy stuff. You yeah. know, I, I, I got to tell you something. I was reading up a few things on you. You got to be... I, have you relaxed at all? You have more credits. You're the hardest working guy. I mean, you've done more things than anybody I know. You know, it's funny, Michael, because um, just this last few weeks, I got, uh, I, I can't even talk about this uh, for, for legal reasons, but I'm trying not to do stuff. Now. You know, I'm trying to say, look, you know, I, I want to, I want some, I don't want to be controlled by a contract. I don't want to be obligated i right. want to pick and choose anything that i want to do i don't care what it is i don't care if it's a student film right i want to be able to do it myself and and see the end i can touch the end right so that's where i'm at now you know when you become i mean i my my, my success story was practically a miracle I, I, I didn't go to new york till i was 30. jeez i don't know how the hell i ever i just it, it was luck i mean i mean i worked hard I was, you know i'm not uh, putting myself down but i mean i worked hard but i was also lucky and i don't know how it happened it just kept i just kept going and um but you've done so much i mean you've done everything there is to do i mean you know well, I, didn't I, tell people, I, I I played so many cops i should get a pension <laughs> yes <laughs> and, uh, so uh, but it's been great it's been great but now i'm trying to pick and choose more and be more selective you know you when you when you come out like I did at thirty and you're you know you were I was a bellhop or not a bellhop I was a bellhop in Florida years before because you know I played for the Steelers for like a, I had a cup of coffee with them and then uh, yeah but wait wait a second don't don't who, no but later on but I, I was a, a bus boy in, in okay. New York I was the only Caucasian bus boy in Manhattan all the Chinese and right that's a whole story and then um, I was a waiter at O'Neill's Balloon you remember that joint across yeah. the Lincoln Center yeah of course. And that's where I met uh, this actor named Joe Cortese, who uh -huh. going to do a play with Danny Aiello at the Helen Hayes Theater called Knockout about boxers. Uh -huh. And naturally, I boxed a little bit. If you're from Youngstown and you can walk, you probably boxed a little Fine. bit. Right. So he asked me if I could show him a couple of moves in boxing. And I said, sure. I mean, it's simple. It's not much to it. You jab, right hand, mm -hmm. hook, body shots. And Joe really didn't know how to box. Good looking kid, big, strapping, handsome guy. So he introduced me to everybody concerned and they hired me as the, as the stand in for Joe. And Joe was doing a movie in Manhattan called Windows with Talia Shire. And he was missing rehearsals because they, of course, they were shooting over. And I was going on for him with Danny. And uh, eventually they, they hired me. That's, that was my break. Uh, I hated to have it on the back of Joe, you know, but it was just one of those things. That's how I got started. It's unbelievable. You know, I got to tell you my one. I, I'll tell you how I met you, how I was introduced to you. I, I met you at Il Forno. What's that? Il Forno, right? Yeah, no, no, no. But uh, before that, okay, different oh, introduction. Before. Yes. I, am, uh, I was in prison 
and uh, I was doing time in Lompoc. And all of a sudden, the state, the, uh, well, actually, the uh, Organized Crime Division of L.A. picks me up and brings me to L.A. County Jail. They want to indict me on some stupid case, right? So they put me in solitary. I'm, on, I'm actually on death row, a murderer's row, they called it, because everybody on that tier was either uh, there for, <clears throat> they were either facing the death penalty or life without parole. I had the Menendez brothers there. Uh, the ninja killer there, you know, supposedly they hired ninjas to kill their father and mother. O.J. Simpson eventually came on that tier when they locked him up. So I'm on that tier. I'm on a parole violation, right? It was crazy, but they, they were giving me the business. So <clears throat> in that particular tier, we had bars. It wasn't, uh, you know, a solid door. And I had the television was on the, uh, you know, right outside of my, yeah. uh, my cell. I was there for 11 months. 11 months they kept me there until I finally resolved the case and they sent me back to Lompoc and then I got out a couple of months later. But every night, and I'm not kidding, I think it was six o'clock at night, married with children would come on and it's the only thing that made me laugh. And I, I waited for that show every single night I wanted to come on. And I gotta tell you more, I was telling my wife, I said, you know, the one enjoyment I got here is watching Al Bundy and this whole, I, I said, I love the show. Well, my mother-in-law, who was a devout Christian, she said, what's happening to my, to my son-in-law? He's going crazy. She was praying for me because I loved the show so much and I kept talking about it. But oh, I'll tell you, for funny. 11 months, that's what I look forward to at six o'clock every night. It was, uh, you were unbelievable. In you that know, show. it's a funny thing. When I got that part, I was, I was out in LA. They flew me out for a, a possible pilot for a series, not, not married with children. And then that fell apart when I was out there. Mm -hmm. I was out there for like two days. And they said, now it's, it, that's done. So I was playing handball at the Hollywood Y. And I got this call from my agent. He said, look, there's, a, there's this series that's going to be on this new network called Fox. I said, Fox, they make movies. I said, well, they're going into television. I said, well, he said, it's called Married with Children. I said, it's a terrible title. <laughs> They said, well, they want to see you. They've seen everybody for this part of this guy. And we read the script. It's awful. But you're right, you're right around the corner from uh, Sunset Gower. The office is there. It's a guy named Ron Levitt, Michael Moye. And they'd like to see you. You know, why don't you, we'll send you a script over. You can read it in the, the locker room. I said, all right, why not? You know, I'm out here. So I read it and I was chuckling a little bit and I thought, this will never go. It's offensive, you know, fat women and midgets. And so I got over there and I went in and they were there and these guys looked like gas station attendants. Really? I mean, really, not to put the gas station attendants down, but they just didn't look like producers. And I had my bag with all my gloves. You know how the handball gloves hang yeah. off the bag, yeah. all sweaty? And they wanted to know about that. And then they wanted to know if I'd read. I said, sure, because living in New York, I was used to auditioning all the time. Mm -hmm. So they gave me this size. I looked at them and I said, OK, let's go. And then I read it. And it, it just, you know, sometimes when you when you don't have time, you lock on to the first thing that comes into your head about how to do it. And I thought, this reminds me of my uncle, the same uncle I mentioned to you. He was a mm -hmm. he ended up a seventh district Supreme Court judge in Ohio, but he was a, a character. Mm hmm. So I read it like, like him. And he was like the self-deprecating guy, like nothing was going to go right. And he was, right. he was ready for that. So in other words, uh, you know, I came home from work and uh, Peggy says, Al, I ran over the dog. He's dead. I said, What's for dinner? <laughs> yeah. So they liked that approach because apparently they were hearing from all the other wonderful actors that they saw for that. They were doing it more like Gleason you know, yelling and mad and all the right. time mad. And I was just like, well, what else is now? Right. That's somehow that, you know, it was a switch. Was and, uh, and, you know, again, it's a lot of luck because I heard Barry Diller. I think the story's true. He was like right under Murdoch at Fox. And he went over to the producers a week before we were going to start shooting. And he said to them, you got the girl. You can do a hell of a lot better for the guy. Mm. And, uh, they said, well, we only got a week and we like him. So, you know, he's not a comedic actor. And that was another thing. I wasn't, you know, they, they picked me out of Mice and Men at Hartford Stage. Wow. 
but that's what happened. But Ed, I'm telling you, that was clear. You, you were, you were so brilliant tonight. There's one thing that I always remember. So many lines, but one. There was one episode I remember. Somebody came to the house and uh, and you had to pay them, and I think it was five dollars. And you turned around and said, "I don't carry that kind of money with me." <laughs> I cracked that <laughs> you know, I didn't write that. See, that's the thing that's funny. The writers were so funny. I don't know if you saw the one I did about The Godfather. Oh, I saw every one of them. Yes. I love that. And <laughs> yes. I also played James Bond. Yeah, I remember. They let me do anything. I did any, you know, everything and everything. And I honestly, I loved it. I, I thought it was a great job. And I thought it was, you know, I said to people, well, we didn't win any awards. It wasn't the, the, the critics didn't really, you know, it was a little too. Yeah, at that time, it was a little too much. Yeah, it was a little abrasive and it offended a lot of people. But I always said, look, it's funny. Oh, it was, it was, everybody was funny. It was hysterical. I mean, the, everybody was so brilliant in there. But you, you, I, I'll never forget that. I'm telling you. I wish, I like to watch episodes now. It still make me laugh. Well, you know, when I got Modern Family, in a way, it was a relief because I, you know, the, the, the big comedy stuff was done by Ty Burrell and Eric Stone Street. They were younger guys, you know, they were doing all the Pratt Falls and running around. And I thought, yeah, I just all I have to do is watch. <laughs> so it was kind of nice. Let, let me ask you on these. Did, did you ad lib a lot or did you have to follow the script or did you just, you know, on, do your on, own lines? Uh, on, 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 which one? On, on Married with Children. I, you know, there's a little bit of it. Uh huh. Excuse me. There's a little bit of it, but I'd be lying if I said I, I wrote anything. Uh -huh. I, I really, I'm, I'm one of those guys. I, I depend on you know the separation of church and state. If right. I like, I'm going to act, and you're going to write. Thank you very much. Gotcha. And and I try to I try to follow that. Every now and then something will come out accidentally, or maybe somebody drops something, and you might say something, and if they like it, they keep it. Most of the time, they don't. But uh, I remember I did a thing on Modern Family where um, uh, it was it was a show where we were going to take a, a, a family portrait and we were all dressed in white. It was a wonderful episode. And I'm already in my white stuff. I'm reluctant. I don't want to do it, but I've got to do it. Now I'm at my little bar and I'm having a glass of red wine. And people are still getting dressed. And down the stairs comes my son-in-law. And he only had white jeans. They were too tight. And my daughter said, those jeans are not a prayer. I'll stand behind somebody. I'm in white. Let me alone. She said, you remind me of that guy from Dance Fever. <laughs> and, I, I, and then we ran that take. And then I said, listen, the next time we do the other take, when she says Dance Fever, put the camera on me and, and hold it till I say a line. There's no problem with that. So I have the wine. And I'm not necessarily looking at them. I'm sort of looking off, but I'm listening. And she said, you remind me of dance, that show, that crazy show, Dance Fever. And, I, and I'm looking, I'm swirling the glass and I say, Denny Terrio, Cleveland, Ohio. <laughs> and I take a sip. <laughs> now, most of the people wouldn't even know what I'm talking right, about. Right, right. But it was funny. Uh -huh. You know, and they kept that. They kept that was it one in. of my favorites, you know, Denny Terrio. Because we used to watch that show. Oh, yeah. Time. Yeah, I remember when I was filming a movie, with the movie I met my wife on, Danny Terrio came down. He was on the set with us. Uh, I enjoyed meeting him back then. <laughs> well, the first time I, I remember seeing you was at Il Forno, and I was with Ray. Yes. We were sitting outside, and you were inside with your wife and your family. Yes. And, oh, Ray was, oh, that's, 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 that's Michael Francis. That's Michael Francis. You know, I said, oh, yeah, 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 I saw him. And, uh... Yeah, we chatted for a while that day. Yeah, yeah. I, I was. I, mean, I actually wanted to say hello, but I didn't want to bother you. Oh no, family and everything. And I said, no, no, no. If he if he comes by, we'll say hi. You know. No, it was a pleasure to meet you back then. And uh, <laughs> let let me ask you this: This might be a silly question, but at a, you had, the, both of those shows, I think you what two hundred and fifty episodes, which is crazy. Well, I t they told me I got a call uh, last year sometime from somebody. And they said, you know, you've eclipsed Lucille Ball for half-hour shows on, on national television prime time. Right. I said, what are you talking about? They said, you've done over 500 something. You know? And I said, wouldn't that be a better question for a crossword puzzle? <laughs> and they said, well, this is, she had the record. And I said, well, they're not saying I was better than she. 
right? They're just saying I got more. You got more. Well, that shows you something. That tells you something to have that kind of longevity. But no, it was it was it was nice. Do, do you had if you had a look? Do you have a preference? I mean, which show did you enjoy more? I couldn't honestly say I had a preference because when I was doing Married, of course, I was younger. I was doing more. Uh, I thought it was hilarious, and it was my first big job, so I was very very appreciative of that job. And uh, and then of course, Modern Family was a beautifully made show. It was. Um, Steve Levitin and Chris uh, Lloyd were really expert masters, really at mm-hmm. at the uh, the construction of a show. They had done Frasier and right. Just Shoot Me and uh, uh, another many more, but they were great. I think Golden Girls. So I, I really appreciated the way they put a show together. And Married with Children was a little more loosey goosey. Just right. you know, we were just doing whatever we wanted, which was also fun. Yeah, and, and you know, your character in Married with Children, you were an ex-jock, uh, you were a, a football player. High yeah, high school football yeah. player. But there's more to it than that. You had to be pretty good. You got to try out with the Steelers. Tell us. Yeah. Tell me about it. Well, I, that's another whole uh, interesting thing because I was a, when I was a kid, I was a pretty good little athlete. I was small. Mm-hmm. I was small. I was... Maybe I think when I was a freshman in high school, I was not much over a hundred pounds. Really? Wow. Yeah, yeah. And uh, my best friend was a kid named Jack Banks. He was like one hundred three, mm-hmm. and I was jealous of him because I think I was one hundred one. <laughs> I made the team my sophomore year. I played little league baseball. I was a gymnast. I did diving, and you know, I was an athlete, but I was I was small, thin, thin kid. And so, long story short, I I went through sophomore, junior year. Junior year, I was up to third team. The, the high school was a really a powerhouse mm-hmm. high school team. So now I'm a junior, I'm third string, and I got demoted to fourth string for some reason. And I thought, I'm done, I'm finished. So I thought, well, I'd started lifting weights and I went to the coach and I said, listen, I, I was afraid to talk to him. I mean, I never talked to this coach. He ended up at Michigan, he coached uh, years at Michigan, mm-hmm. nice guy. But- I went to him and I, I tried to talk to him and tell him, I, I don't want, all I'm doing out here is holding bags for guys that run over me. I'd be better served if I went to the Y and, and worked out. And right. Maybe I'll have a shot my senior year because I'm 153 now. Mm-hmm. So Still small. I, and he said, kid, if you, he didn't even know my name. He said, kid, if you quit the team, you won't get a uniform next year. And he walked away. Hmm. So I went home and I told my dad my plans. My father was disappointed. Right. You're quitting, you know. And, but I did that. And I was religious. I was fanatical about it. I had a little workout book. I had a set of weights in the basement. Anyway, I come back my senior year. I'd worked construction all summer. I was about 185, hmm. 190, maybe close to 190. They didn't even know who I was. They thought I was a transfer student. Wow. That had come in. So I played my senior year. We, we were undefeated. Uh, you know, I did well that, that year. And then I went on to play for Ohio U right. two years and then Youngstown State. And I'm just trying to get over all this. And then I got picked up by the Steelers, Chuck Knoll's first year, uh, 1969. And I was trying to learn outside linebacker, but I ne- had never played outside linebacker. Mm-hmm. It's difficult to make a pro team at a position you never played. Right. I gave it my best shot. And then he, he was so nice to me. Noel was very nice. And the day I got cut, he called me in with the playbook. You know, you're going. Yeah. <laughs> and he said, look, I like you. <laughs> he said, I like how you play, but I, I can't, this is my first year too. Mm-hmm. I got to show something. You never played. You don't know what the hell you're doing out there. And I, it was the only position I think I could have played. Right. So he said, I can hook you up with the Eagles. Really? All I got to do, I already talked to them. They're desperate for linebackers. I can do it, but you got to tell me right now. And we'll get your car. You can drive up uh, Route 80 and you can go to Philly and you can try off th- with them. You got to tell me now. So I thought about it for like, 10 seconds. I said, no, I'm done. Hmm. I was sick of it. Yeah. Huh? 
And, uh, and it's probably the best decision I ever made. Yeah, but you know, it's a big deal just to get a tryout with them. I oh, mean, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, you, I know you. No, it, was a, it, was a, it was a big deal. It was, uh, it was exciting. And they went on to be the Steelers, the Steel Curtain. Not here. that year. They only won one game that year, my rookie mm. year. They beat Detroit in the opener. And uh-huh. then, then they won the Super Bowl. They won four. Yeah, that's when me and Joe Green and Terry Bradshaw and the whole yeah, thing. Yeah, came Terry by, yeah. came in the next year. That, that my rookie year was Terry Hanrity, uh-huh. from Notre Dame, and uh, Terry was a hell of a player. But uh, so let I me, was better off. So, in married with children, did you suggest that you know <clears throat> you use that thing, of, or did they do that? The no, right? I didn't. I think they knew from my resume, and they and I think they, if I recall, I think they asked me about it. I said, yeah, well, I played, you know. And make it and i always tell people i had a cup of coffee with them uh-huh. and uh <laughs> <laughs> and i know some of those guys i mean i you know i met them and um i was glad of that decision because you know that's a rough that's a rough way to go yeah well let, let me ask you this then you go you move on to be an octopus you're hank yeah, yeah. How, how is it how do you get into that when you just you know you're trying to oh, michael that's another story. I, my manager called me and said, look, they want you to do a, a, a part in this um, sequel. Mm-hmm. I had never seen the first one. <laughs> oh, no. And, uh, of course, I knew about it. Right. And uh, I said, well, it's Pixar, right? And they said, yeah. I said, well, do I get sides or something? He said, well, no, it's just a, it's an offer. But it's probably like a cameo. Uh, you 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 get paid by the session. They got like about four sessions set up for you. I said, "But I just go do it." It's Pixar, you know. They they're going to make a billion dollars on this thing. It's Ellen DeGeneres, and but I said, "Okay, I'll do it." Don't worry. So I show up at Disney, and you work alone on these things. And by the way, you work hard. These guys are very polite, but they get what they want. You don't leave there until you they have what they think they want. Mm-hmm. So uh, it was like a little cartoon you play to. And it was uh, like a black and white, almost stick figures. They had this octopus. Mm-hmm. Couldn't make much out of it. So I did it. And then they called me three months later. And I went back and repeated some of it. Then I did a little bit more. And then this happened four or five times. And then I thought, all my stuff was with Ellen DeGeneres. And pretty soon I said to my manager, hey, you know what? This is not a cameo. Mm-hmm. This is arguably the second lead in the movie. Now, what I think happened was they didn't have the graphics on this creature. Right. They, were, they were developing it as I was, you know, doing my sessions. And it became so good because these mimic octopuses or whatever you call them are right. amazing. Right. And they thought, wait a minute, he can escape and travel from exhibit to exhibit he can take her through so it became a lead role without my knowledge wow and and so yeah it was it was it turned out to be quite a good thing for me and how do you how, how do you because you're still acting in a way uh, ed because yeah. you got you know you got to be in that moment how do you how do you do that when you're just standing in front of a microphone and you know what michael it's it's um you know, it, it helps if you have a, a, the experience to fall back on, mm-hmm. which gives you a certain kind of confidence about, yeah, I, I, I don't know what an octopus sounds like if an <laughs> octopus could talk. <laughs> right. So I'll just, you know, I realized he was grumpy. He had lost a, a, a tentacle. Right. And he was ha- unhappy where he was. He wanted to get to Cleveland. Uh, was it Cleveland? Right. It's, uh, Cleveland, I think. Yeah, it was yeah, Cleveland. It was where people yeah. would leave him alone because he had to go in that petting exhibit. And he hated being touched. So I thought, well, he's phobic. And he's angry. That's all I need. That's it. That's it. Wow. It's, it's fairly, you know, it's not that complicated. As you, you know, you could imagine. It's just, uh, and then, then you just stay with it. You just stay with it. And you commit to it. Unbelievable. And uh, that's what happened. That was a that was a great job. Amazing, amazing. 
I got to ask you something now because um, maybe a little bit of advice is something you can you can share with me. For the last 20 years, and you know this business, I've had people coming to me, we got to make a movie on your life. And, you know, I've had every producer in town and, and this. And I, I was never really interested. My wife was against it. She said, you know, we got enough stuff we're dealing with. Yeah. But uh, about a year ago, I was approached by um, Kennedy Marshall. And uh, I spoke with Frank Marshall and uh, Rob uh, Kutnowski and uh, a writer by the name of Ron Shelton. I don't know if you know Ron. I know Ron. You know Ron. Well, Ron's, yeah. a good, Ron's a very good writer. Ter terrific guy. So they came to and me. He's a nice guy. Yeah, I, I like Ron a lot. Thank you. Yeah, really nice guy. I've got to know him very, very well. We've been working together now for a year. And we were talking about a movie. And then um, they said, you know, Mike, there's so much content here, so much information. We want to turn this into a television series. So I cut a deal with them. And I really liked them all, really liked them. And, you know, they're, they're like the A-list for me, A-team. Yeah, they and, are. And so for the last year, um, I've been working with Ron, and he put together three C. You know, you know how this thing goes better than me. He had to put together three seasons for the network and a whole timeline. Yes. And then he just uh, last week turned in the first draft of the pilot which I thought was brilliant. I mean, I'm, I'm so happy. He's such a, such a great writer. So is it, it looks a like- Is it a half hour show or it's an hour show? It's an hour show. Yeah, the pilot was, uh, uh, I think it was uh, 60 pages, something like that. That's an hour. <clears throat> yeah. He gave me the first draft and I'm, I'm doing my thing because I told him, listen, they said, Michael, what's important to you? I said, look, my story is out there. You know, I'm going to be 70 years old this year. If this is, yeah. what's important to me is that this goes. I mean, that we make it happen, yeah. number one. Yeah, yeah. And number two, authenticity. I said, because I've watched every mob show that there is out there. Sure. There's brilliant ones out there. And then there's those that are not so good. And if I'm going to do something, it has to be very authentic. Otherwise, why would I? Of bother? course. And so, you know, I, I go through it and uh, they've really captured that. I tell you, Ron knows my life better than well, I know Ron, my Ron, you're in good hands with Ron Shelton. Well, I, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, I've really got yeah. to like him. So he's handed in the first draft of the pilot. Um, I'm going over it now, just, you know, doing a, little, a couple of things with dialogue. Dialogue is important to me. And then uh, we'll turn it in. I think they're getting to the point where they're going to start casting it. And they started talking to me Are about you names. Play yourself? No, no. No, no, no. You're, you're, you're like a producer. Yeah, I'm a producer and, cons I, you know, all those titles that you got. and um, yeah, That's the way to go. Yeah, I, I, I don't want to be in it. I mean, they made a cameo here and there, but... Um, well, you're going to have, you're going to have a, they're going to listen to you. Ron will listen to you. He has, They're not yeah. going to do anything. They're not going to do anything you don't want to see uh, or anything that you feel is not authentic and real. Interesting thing about Ed, you know, one of his good friends, one of his good relationship, Joe Pistone, Donnie Brasco. Obviously, you know, I know Joe well. We did the uh, sit down a couple of weeks back. So uh, interesting. We're all going to get together in the next couple of weeks when uh, when Joe finds himself uh, the time to come out and, and sit down and have a nice Italian meal. So uh, very interesting. You know, Joe Pesci, I know Joe very well. Do you? <laughs> and uh, I, I've known Joe for years. And uh, I haven't seen him for a while. He's he's out of sight a lot now. But, right. Uh, I heard you talking about him and, and how good he was in all those movies. He was fantastic. He's so good. I mean, he, and he I was. thought Al was great in Donnie Brasco. You you want some? Ed? I think that was his best role. I do too. I mean, he I was. Swear to God, I think uh, the thing with his son and everything was so wonderful. Um, I knew Al. I did something with Al years ago, and uh, and I used to play. As I told you too many times I was playing handball. One of the guys I was playing handball with was a kid named, I believe his last name was Gian Turkle, but he was Italian, uh -huh. Charlie. And he was an FBI guy. Really? Yeah. He used to come in and lock his, he had the gun, he had the badge, you know, and we play doubles. Uh -huh. You know, when you play handball, you don't really talk about what you do. Right. It's all about the game. So one day he came out and he says to me, he was getting dressed. We had showered. And he says to me, hey, Eddie, do you know, uh, I'm not going to name these actors because, right. again, it's not a flattering story. But, you know, so, 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 so. And I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know these guys. Yeah, I know them pretty well. And uh, he says, well, yeah, um, they were out. Uh, in, I think it was Queens. They were out. They were uh, character witnesses for John Gotti. Hmm. They, they like John Gotti, these guys. 
And, uh, you know, we're trying to put this motherfucker away, you know? Yeah. And, uh, we don't tell him you see him, right? I said, yeah, I see him. I said, tell him we don't appreciate it. <laughs> and, and it was like the first time, you know, I, I thought, oh, okay. Now this guy, Charlie, who was from Boston, very nice Italian American kid. And his, he had partnered with Donnie Brasco mm. at one point in time, something else, you know, Joe Pistone. Yeah. So since then, I got to know Joe because I do this podcast called The Undercovers. Right. And it's an interesting, you know, these guys that, I mean, the, the guys who do the DEA in Mexico and the, the drug cartels and even in Europe and the Chinese, it's, it's man, it's something else. Oh, but yeah. Joe Pistone is from Jersey. You know, he's from Jersey. You, I don't know if you ever met Joe. Did you ever oh, meet him? Oh, I don't know. I, I know Joe very well. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, about three weeks ago, I did a sit down with him. If you go on YouTube, you'll see it. I've oh, been, I got to see it. Yeah, I've been knowing you Joe. You didn't know that I know him, right? No, I didn't know that. I didn't know that, but I'm going to mention well, I, You know, Joe, and you, you, I know you're going to agree. You would never in a million years think that Joe was anything other than what he pretended to be. Oh, well, without a doubt. In those days. I mean, this guy was... You know what the deal. You know what the deal with him, Ed. And I told Joe this, and when we sat down, I said, "You know, people say this and that, but the bottom line is, you did your job better than we did yeah. our job, because yeah. to be on. Let me tell you, to be undercover like that for six years, and that's what they call deep, deep undercover. And I said to him, in the, and when we talked, I said, Joe, I know you're you're not a scary kind of guy." But, you know, we weren't that lame on the street. Any day, we could have maybe by accident even identified you, and that would have been it. So how... So you, know what he, you know what he told me, Michael, and this would probably be... I mean, this is not any kind of advice, but it's, uh, it, it might be. He said to me, uh, we were recording one day, and he said to me, you know, I'm not an actor, you know. Uh, I said, no, I, I, I would uh, argue that point. You're an actor. Mm -hmm. I act for money. You acted to save your life. Yeah. I said, I can imagine in your profession, less was more. Yes. As they say. And he said, oh, absolutely. So, for example, he would say, I don't drink. Right. I never, it never agreed with me. So when I, I, never tr I never pretended that I drank. Right. I would tell these guys, I don't drink. It doesn't, it doesn't agree with me. And, you know, being, being as close to his actual self as he could possibly yeah. be lessens the chance of making that mistake. He exactly. said, I used to hang out in these bars, this one bar in particular, where a lot of guys, a lot of wise guys hung out. Mm -hmm. He said, if I was at the bar and a couple of guys next to me started talking about a score or something they were planning on doing, he said, I would walk away. I just pay it and I'd leave. And they noticed that after a while, this guy's not interested in shit, you know. You're right. He said, I was only interested in a, in a narrow kind of thing, you know. It's yeah. very interesting. Oh, he's, uh, you know, it's funny. I, I'll give you a couple of quick stories, but I met him once on the street that I remember, and he, he reminded me. He said, Michael, I came out to your dealership one time, and I was with so-and-so, and we were talking about cars and this and that and that. I said, Joe, I'm so happy that's the only time I met you on the street. <laughs> I said, because I... I you know, I knew Lefty really well, and I knew Sonny Black well, and, uh, uh, but fortunately, we never did anything together. We just knew each other. But, uh, you know, I met Joe about 20 years ago. I've done a number of events with him, and we were sitting at a, uh, we were doing an event with uh, all the pro sports. It was a security thing about gambling and, you know, relationships at the players. Yeah. <clears throat> and we're sitting at the table, and uh, I said to him, Joe, I said, you know what? He said, what? I said, the way we're sitting here, you could actually be the mob guy and I could be the FBI agent. That's how that's Jesus, exactly. Yeah, exactly. that's how it was unbelievable. You know, I don't think anybody has ever been. Well, I know it for a fact. Nobody's ever succeeded like he had, uh, you know, on the street like that. Amazing. No, no. And uh, yeah, he's an amazing guy. Interesting guy. Well, if he ever comes out here. I just got I just got a text from him yesterday. He had seen the finish thing we did on his story uh -huh. and uh and i had quite a bit to do with that because they had written quite a lengthy script that they wanted joe to follow and i said guys and i had to say it right in front of them because there was no time i said joe's not an actor 
Joe's not a professional actor. Right. If you're going to have him reading and try to make it natural, you're not going to get there. Let me just ask him questions. Mm -hmm. He knows his story better than anybody else. Let him just talk off the cuff. So that we finally did that, and it was it was it was the right thing to do. Believe me, I, you know I, sometimes you're wrong, but I wasn't wrong here because off the cuff, he's, he's sensational. Yeah, well, no, believe me, I know that because you know I've been I've been offered roles in movies, and you know, I'll tell you a quick story. Do you know Dan Gordon? Do you know who Dan is? I know the name. Yeah, director, writer. You know, he's done a bunch yeah, of yeah, things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, so we become friendly over the years, and he uh, one day he sends me a script. And then I'm going to get back to Joe. I want to say something, but he sends me a script for a movie and there's a part in there that's based upon my my life. Right. So he says, what did you think of so and so? I forget the name. And I said, well, Dan, you wrote about me. I said, but that's great. He says, well, we want you to play that part. I said, Dan, I'm not an actor. He's no, you could do it. You're going to be yourself. I said, first of all, there's four pages of dialogue. I said, I can't read this. You know, I'll tell you a funny thing. I've been speaking. uh, I've probably spoken over 2000 times at different events. Do you know, do you know that I've never been able to read my own notes on the stage? They throw me off reading my own notes. I have to just go up and speak. So I said to him, I can't read dialogue. I said, I I just don't have that talent. So anyway, they trapped me into doing this thing. I'll tell you a whole story how they got me into it. They got the director on the phone because I said, Dan, I'm not doing it. They got the director on the phone, the, the, the actors and all that. They said, Michael, we're filming this in August. We really want you to play this role. I said, guys, I can't do it. Forget it. And they said, OK, I understand. We, we, we called your agent. We're sending you a ticket. We'll see you in August. And that's it. They hung up the phone on me. So I did this little role. And I'll be honest, with you, it was hard. It was hard because I just can't read dialogue. I don't know what it is. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, well, you just have to practice it. That's all. Yeah, but so I understand with Joe. But I, I will tell you this. When Joe comes out here, I don't know if you know it. I got these restaurants now, these Slices Pizza Places. We're franchising. You know, I heard about that. But, uh, you know, since all this pandemic thing, I, yeah, otherwise well, yeah. I would have been there by now. Yeah, well, yeah, we, we got two. Barry out and stuff. Yeah, we got two in L.A. They sit down also. We got two in L.A. We just opened one in uh, San Mateo yesterday. It was a grand opening. And then I have one in Newport Beach, kind of family-run store. But I told Joe, when Joe comes out here, the three of us got to get together, for sure. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, we'll absolutely. sit down. We'll pick a place. We'll have dinner. Yeah, it'll be a lot of fun. Uh, w- w- that would be so much fun. I, I want to do that. Yeah. Yeah, that's for yes, sure. I love, uh, you know, I grew up eating Italian food because... You know, Youngstown was a, was a melting pot of because of the steel mills. Yes. But there were a lot of Italians, probably more Italians in, where I grew up than Irish. There were, there were Irish, but not as many as I thought there were. Right. It was mostly Italian, Lithuanians, Croatians, Yugo, um, just all kinds of other ethnicities, which was fun in uh-huh. Youngstown because you got to eat the different foods. But primarily it was Italian. Yeah. And, uh, for me, it was, and I cook. I mean, I learned from my, uh, I had my, my best friend was a kid named Chichi Pasquale uh-huh. and his mother, Jenny. I used to go in the kitchen and watch her, you know, do the brajol and, you know, all that stuff. And I'd watch her make the meatballs and everything. So yeah. I love that food. And you, you ate at El Forno quite a bit with, with Ray. Oh, yeah. yeah. All the, the time. Food was great there. Food was great. All the time. Yeah. I, you know, I knew that was my, that was my place. Yeah. Yeah, it was a, it was a good place. We got some good restaurants out here in in Newport Beach too. Some pretty good Italian restaurants. But I'll tell you what, you'll you'll love the pizza. My friend, uh, uh, my partner, we go back about thirty five years together, and we've had restaurants together. So about two. You remember uh, uh, Primos on Sunset? Did, oh sure. Okay. Well, Tony, sure. did you ever meet Tony, the owner? You, I don't know if I met him or not. You, you know, know who I knew was was the guy for on uh, from Mulberry Pizza. You know, uh, uh, yeah, from yeah. Hobo. Right, right. Well, uh, anyway, he's he, a character. He was a character. Primos was was a place we had for about fifteen years. He sold a couple of the restaurants. He comes to me about two years ago, two and a half years ago, and he says, "Michael, he says, what do you want to do?" I said, "Whatever you want to do, Tony." He said, "Well, I want to be in the pizza business." I said, Tony, everybody and their brothers in pizza, how are we going to be different? You know, what are we going to? He says, give me two years and I'll show you. So he travels the country, spends about four or five months in Italy, and he comes back with a recipe and a system that's perfect for franchising. 
So we go into business and we got seven stores now, but uh, oh, that's the, great. The pizza is great. You, you're going to love it. The meatball, everything we got, pizza. you're going to love, I love it. Pizza. You're going to love it. So that's, that's definitely a date. You know, in Youngstown, I don't know if you ever heard of this. They have a thing. It's still there. It's still, it's still operational, this particular kind of pizza. It's called Briar Hill Pizza. Mm-hmm. And it was, it was, it was, um, it was St. Anthony's. Uh, they, they still make it every Saturday. You know, the women come in and they make it. And it, th- there was a hill down to the steel mills. And they had their peppers. They grow their peppers right. there. And, of course, back in the day, the cheese they used was government cheese, you know, because it was rationed during the war when they started making this pizza. So it was Romano. Right. They use Romano cheese and then the peppers. And they made and they called it Briar Hill Pizza because that was the neighborhood that they, right. they uh, you know, that they cooked it in. And they still make it. And every time I go back, it's one of the first places I go. I go get the, the Briar Hill Pizza, you know. Well, that, that's good. You're going to you're going to love Oz, you know, and everybody everybody thinks that, uh, you know, the only good pizza is in New York. And obviously there is good pizza back there. I mean, look, yeah, sure. we love it. But everybody thinks that the secret for that was the water in New York. But that's not true. They said that about the bagels. Too. Yeah, it's it's not true. And, and we got great bagel places out here, too, in California. Huh? Oh, yeah. yeah. So it's it's just the way you make it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, it's funny. You know, this joint down on Lincoln. uh the Italian place on Lincoln where you get everything, you know, it's like a deli. Oh yeah. Bay Bay city. Yes. Bay city. I was in there one day and I, I enjoyed it. They got the grandmother, you know, the grandmother and everything. And I was in there in line. And this kid I knew was from New York, was an Italian American from New York. He's standing behind me. He says, Oh, how you doing? How's it going? I said, Oh, good, good. You know, grabbing a few things. And he says, it's good. It's good. You know, it's not, it's not New York, you know. I mean, let's face okay. it, but it's good. I said, "Yeah, no, it's good." And you're right; it's not like New York. These are actual Italians. Uh. <laughs> These guys are from Italy, you know. And I, and it's funny how you know New York guys. If, if it's not New York, yeah, they think sorry, it's no it good. Just can't I know. Be. But I understand that because yeah. it's the atmosphere of New York. Exactly. But you know, you, I lived in the village. I lived on Morton Street, and of course, John's uh-huh. Pizza was right around the corner. Right. I used to go there. I love that, you know. Well, you know, you know what's happened there? And I, all, New Yorkers always say the same thing. Well, we can't get good food out here. I said, you know what? New York has great food. There's more of it because there's more restaurants there. But I'll tell you what happened. I've eaten all over the country in every city like you, I'm, I'm sure. And they got good restaurants everywhere now. And I, I think the reason for that, Ed, is because all of these celebrity chefs in these last oh, 10 or 15 God. years. It, that has to be it. Yeah, they've raised the level of food. So people know good food now. You got to you gotta be good. Yeah, it's you know? so, you know, I just had, the other day, there's this Italian place on Montana called Forma. Yeah, Forma. I know the place. And I think they just opened another one. Maybe uh-huh. it was in Hollywood. I'm not sure. But that food is great. Yeah. Yeah, it is. You know, it's, I mean, it's they're, great they're really, they're really... Uh, they're really good. The food is great everywhere. And that's wonderful. Well, listen, I'm going to look forward to uh, to having dinner with you, with Joe, without Joe, you know, as soon as... Now, listen, I'm telling you, let's do this because we'll, we'll really have a good time. For sure. When we hang, when we leave... I mean, you, you, you have a glass of red wine every now and then, don't you? Uh, uh, all right. Now I got to make a confession. <laughs> you know, during this whole pandemic... Haven't been able to travel much. My wife and I have spent so much time in Napa Valley. I got to be honest. We drive up there. I love the wine tasting. Oh. You know, no, I, got I, to- I, I haven't been there for a while, but I used to go to Youngville. And- oh, yeah, Youngville. You know, did you know Carmen Policy? Uh, I do, yes. Because uh, Carmen's from Youngstown. You know, Carmen and I are good friends. Uh-huh. And he had a little vineyard up there for a while. Did he really? Uh, a high-end... Uh, we got a lot of stories. We got a lot of things to talk about. It's uh, yeah. Uh, Carmen has some great stuff. I mean, Carmen knows everything about Youngstown because he represented all these guys, you know, for right. years. Well, I, I love it up there. You know, it's amazing. My father back in, in the early 70s, mid 70s, I'll never forget. He one day said to me, we were talking about wine. I was young. And he said to me, son, remember what I'm going to tell you. One day, the best wines in the world are going to come out of California. 
I don't know how he thought that, or why, why, but he was prophetic in that because all these years later, we got some of the best venues, best, best wines in the world here now in Napa Valley. And about it, well, you know, years ago, all those farms up in Napa were Italian farmers. That's right. Yeah. yeah. They were little mom and pop things. And, you know, there's, uh, there's one Zinfandel up there. They call it the black chicken. Really? And I, I'm trying to think what the name of the family. It's an Italian family, four or five, ge- maybe three or four generations mm-hmm. back. And when they had the party lines, you know, they used to have the party lines, the telephones, you know, you could actually yeah. come in and say, hey, can I, you know, come on, you've been on too long. I need to make a call. And it was during Prohibition, I think, at that time. Mm-hmm. And uh, the family had a grocery store. So the people, the local people would buy produce from them, eggs and bacon and whatever they needed. But they also had what they sold, black chicken. Mm-hmm. Chicken was the Zinfandel. That was it, huh? And this so they'd say, yeah, and uh, give me a half a dozen black chicken. You know, and that was how they got away with it. Well, to answer your question, yes, uh, we're going to have some nice bottles of wine. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. we're going to really. You know, by the way, ourselves. Joe and none of those guys, none of those ex undercover guys, DEA guys, whoever they may be, that I've met, and I've been with a bunch of them in the same room, and they would all tell me, this is probably the safest place in town. I would say, not necessarily. <laughs> How do you guys have, you know, have bounties? Right. And, uh, <laughs> they are all, none of them drink. No. None of them drink anymore because they're all in some form of PTSD. That's right. You know, it's funny. Re- recently, just in the last two weeks, I met a, uh, a, Joe introduced me to him. He lives out in Costa Mesa. His name is uh, Louis Diaz. He was an ex DEA agent. He's got a book out and everything, but he's the guy that brought Nikki Barnes down. You know, oh, and, yeah. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah, sure. So, so he's been a little friendly with me now. And uh, it's it's amazing. You know, all of these guys that were my enemies Enemy, at one a, point. There was a guy I met with Joe the night I'm speaking about when they were all together. And by the way, I didn't get the place we were going to meet till the last minute. Uh huh. You know, they were yeah. jumping around. And uh, this guy's name is Hector Barreras. Mm-hmm. And he was the guy on the Kiki Camarino case. Really? He's Mexican American, but he was he was born in the states. I think he was born in Arizona or or South, maybe maybe uh, Santa Fe. But he speaks all the dialects. And this guy, and I know you know guys like this in, mm-hmm. in your in your time. When I met him, I looked at him. He was sitting across from me, and I was looking. You know, I was talking to everybody, but I was looking at this guy. I kept drawn drawn back to the guy, and I thought I would not want to have this guy holding a gun on me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It proved to be kind of true if you know his story. There's yeah. a wonderful documentary on this guy, Hector Barreras, is how you say his name. And yeah. a wonderful guy, by the way. But yeah, Amazing. it's a real thing. You know, I got it for me, it's crazy. All these uh <clears throat> all these guys who were my enemies at one point, when things turn around in your life, you know, and all of a sudden you find out, you know, these are really nice guys. You know, I gotta tell you, you know, Ed growing up. You know, with my dad, who was had so much publicity, so much media, all these trials and everything, we had constant surveillance around us. I always looked at I looked at law enforcement as the enemy, like they sure. they were so different than us. I didn't trust them, you know. And then obviously, I went through my whole life that way. But once I got out and my life turned around, I started to see things differently. I have so many friends now in law enforcement. Not, we don't share information, nothing like that. We're just friends. Of course. Just good guys, you know, and, and it's, uh, just it's, amazing how you how, it's amazing how life turns around, you know, how things change. It's, it's unbelievable. Really. Well, you, you have quite a story. You have quite a story. I know a lot about you. Well, you know, who I, you know, who I, I really didn't know well on the street. I met him once or twice, but now I've been talking to him. We, we may be doing something together. Me and Sammy Gravano, Sammy the Bull. Yeah. You know, when I say doing something together, everybody wants us to, to have a sit down you know, and, and just go over some things. And we've been thinking about it, talking about it. You know, I, I don't know. There's pros and cons to it, but we, we may make it happen just for just for YouTube to satisfy. You everybody. know, do you have time for a quick sh- story? Sure. There was a guy in Youngstown. He wasn't Italian. He was I think he was German. He's dead now. So, you know, uh-huh. uh, but I'm still not going to say his name. But anyway, he was a, he was a, one of these guys like. He worked for the mob, uh, but he wasn't in the mob. He wasn't Italian. He was a loner. 
-hmm. grew up in my neighborhood and he was older than me by a couple of years. And he was a, he was a dangerous guy. I mean, mm-hmm. I could say he was a bad guy. He was a guy who you couldn't, you know, you, you had to worry about this guy. Right. And he did a lot of time in the, in the, in the joint and everything. But anyway, I knew him just peripherally. I know, you know, he was barred from almost every bar in Youngstown, mm-hmm. but there was this one place that he went and I used to go there too on a Sunday. Cause it was like a club. It was an army Navy club. Right. There's, you know, they had a, you know, you knock on the door, they, they, yeah. they let you in, right? That kind of thing. And I was in there one night and I was probably hung over. It was like a Sunday, you know, you're trying to get well, you got to go to work the next day. And he came in and there was maybe two people in the place, me and him. And we always had this kind of contentious respect. We were friendly, but you know what I mean? It was one yeah, of those I got things. it. I got it. And he says to me, he starts talking to me about, the bartender was an old man and he was, he was telling me how he liked the guy because the guy was nice to him and would always serve him. And he was allowed in there. But if he thought the guy had more money in the register, he'd take it from it. Right. And I said, okay. And he said, and if he wouldn't give it to me, you know, I'd, I'd shoot him. Hmm. And I said, well, that's one way to go. He said, you know, you and I, we ought to do something sometime. We ought to make a move. Now, I knew he was bullshitting me from the, you know, he wasn't serious. Right. He was was trying to get a point across. I said, well, you know, I don't don't take those kind of chances because I can't do any time and I'm not going to do it. Right. You know that. He said, yeah, well, that's the difference, isn't it, between you and me? You're a tough guy. I'm a tough guy. But I'll go that extra step. Mm. You won't. And I said, that's right. You're right. That is the difference. He said, I just wanted to let you know. And I said, you know what, though? I may kill you just by accident. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I was bullshit. You know, right. But that is the difference. Yeah. You know, these guys would kill you. Yeah. I never killed anybody. You know, I wasn't going to kill anybody that I, you know. Sure. I certainly didn't. You know, you think you do, you would if you had to, but if you're defending yourself, yeah, that's the difference. Yeah, and you know what? Some of these, some things that I've heard, you know, Ed, people talk, and you know, they did something like that. They murdered somebody, and they had no conscience about it. No. You know, and look, I'm not going to BS anybody. I mean, I grew up in that life. I saw my share of things. You know, I've spent over 20 years there. But you know you gotta you gotta have a conscience about these things, you know. I mean, some of these guys did not, and they didn't. No, and I, you know, without naming names, you know, there's there's guys out there that you know that take care of business and go to the lunch like nothing happened, and they and they tell you that I didn't feel a thing. No, nothing. No, nothing no and I think I think that that's something that is in your DNA. Yeah, I agree. I agree right. with and that. Maybe the way you're grow, you know, some of these guys had terrible childhoods. And yeah, I, I had a loving family. I was lucky in that regard. I was the oldest of five. So yeah, I always try to take care of my brothers and sisters, and so you know, it wasn't. I was fortunate to be born into a family that was that had love and yeah, humor. And this poor guy I'm talking about, he did not. Yeah, yeah, I know. I did a recently. Uh, <clears throat> I did a, uh, a sit down about the movie, uh, the Iceman, Richard Kuklinski. Oh, that guy. Yeah. And, 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 and if you go back in his childhood, his father, oh, what a disaster, it's terrible disaster, you know? And I, and I say this, look, I grew up in a dysfunctional family, no doubt about it. Cause of my father's all the stuff that was going on, but we had love in the family. Yeah. My yeah. dad and mom loved us, you know, the kids, yes. even though they all got, my brothers and sisters, every one of them had a sad story, bad story. But for some reason, I, I was, uh, you know, I was blessed. I survived. But uh, but we had love, you know, and you got love. It's well, there's so thing. much, Michael, that you can't control when you're a kid. Your yeah. dad born into whatever the, the circumstances that you can't control. Right. So I think at the end of the day, you have to start saying we all have to say and whatever that is that's bothering us. Hey, I forgive Right. Anything, because I didn't know. As a kid, you don't know. You know, you, you don't you're, know. you're a victim, basically, of, of, of y- your parents and yeah. your, your brains. You know, we didn't choose them. Exactly. High color. It's well, all a crapshoot. 
Well, Ed, look, I'm going to let you go. I don't want to keep you all day, but I, I'm no, so happy. It's, I've really this. enjoyed this. I knew no. I was going to. No, this was great, and uh, I'm going to hold you to it now. I'm going to I'm going to actually call Joe when I hang up. You don't with have you. to hold me to it. I'll be the first one there. <laughs> All right, I'm going to let Joe know that we spoke and we we yeah, did. Yeah, tell he, Joe. Yeah, he watches all my YouTube stuff anyway, so he'll see it. Yeah. But I'm going to let him know, and we'll make that plan because I know he'll be out here pr fairly soon, and we'll all get together. Sure, this was a this was believe me, this was a a real pleasure. Well, what I'm going to do, too, when I come into L.A., I come once a week or once every other week. Yeah. Uh, as soon as we, things lighten up there, I know it's still pretty tight in L.A. Yeah, no, but it's, it's, it's getting much better here. Well, then I'll give you a holler. We'll go to dinner. Yeah. For yeah, sure? sure. All right, brother. Listen, thank you so much. I'm going to thank Ray for connecting us again. And uh, okay, my like I said, we will again. stay. Really enjoyed it. We will stay in touch. All right. All right, Take my friend. Yourself. Take care now. You too. Bye bye. Bye bye. Now. So there you have it, Ed O'Neill, Married with Children, Modern Family, uh, Hank the Octopus, and Finding Dory, you know, plus he knows guys on the street, knows Boom Boom Mancini, Joe Pistone. This is a guy that's had a tremendous career, and I consider him a friend. You know, we've met once, but now we've spoken a couple of times. We're going to break some bread, have a nice Italian dinner, maybe bring him to Slices, have some pizza and a good glass of wine. But uh, I love doing these interviews, you know, just, just a great guy, and uh, not interviews. Love doing these sit downs, you know, because I don't really interview. I listen. That's what I'm supposed to do. So, anyway, we got a lot of good things coming up. Again, 500,000. Thanks to all of you. We appreciate it so much. You're going to enjoy the big giveaways. We've got a lot of stuff going out. We're going to continue to do this. MichaelFrancis.com. Uh, you know, just come on board. I want you to be part of my crew. We want to give you content. We want to encourage you, encourage one another. You know, we do these Zoom calls. We've got a lot of good things planned. And uh, we talked about the movie I got, I mean, I'm sorry, the television series I got coming. We got a book coming out over the summer. A lot of good stuff happening. And yes, the Sammy Gravano thing, it's getting closer. I haven't made a deal yet, but it's getting closer. So it may happen. So that's it for today. And uh, again, appreciate you tuning in. How do I always leave you? Be safe, be healthy, God bless you, and I will see you next time.